Uh, speaking of amazing insights and digital transformation accelerated at hyper rate, our next uh, guest, Lenny Hanslink, Chief Strategy Officer at Aerospike. Uh, Lenny has more than 30 years of experience uh, in engineering management, product management, operational management, both in startups and large successful software companies. Lenny previously held executive positions at uh, Novell Enterworks, JD Edwards, Enterprise TV, and Oracle. He has extensive experience in delivering value to customers and shareholders in both enterprise applications and infrastructure software. Lenly believes that business is now happening in real time, absolutely speak to value is key, and that the right infrastructure for serving data to new real-time applications is rapidly accelerating requirements for businesses in order to be successful. Uh, you can follow Lenly on Twitter at P-A-R-K-C-I-T-Y G-L-I-S-S-E. Welcome, Lenny, to the Shrub TV. Hey there, Ray, Lala. So, hey, welcome. <laughs> very interesting listening to Don. You, you know, I've read several of his books, like we all have. Um, and and you know, blockchain's one of those things that um, you know needs massive scale yeah. and needs to be faster than it is. Um, although it's delivering a lot of you know value today, uh, I I did peek into some of his uh, thoughts on supply chain, and you know we went through this massive aggregation and elimination of of any slack in the system, right? And with the COVID um, crisis, if you will, um, a lot of people are rethinking supply chains to be more diverse and to be uh, more decentralized. And to have contingencies, uh, so I think that that's that's something that um, is going to hinge on, you know, distributed information. Um, and when you look at, you know, digital transformation, it's really about opening up our systems. I mean, I, I can remember a conversation, Ray, you and I had, I don't know, you know, 10, 12, 14 years ago, maybe, but it was about, you know. The difference between adversarial relationships in a supply chain and supplying yep. all the information transparently between, you know, consumers and providers, and and really trying to optimize and share the benefits of that, and and I think that, you know, that's at the heart of what we do. It's at the heart of what we do, even you know, in our relationships with, with the bad guys like Amazon, right? They share tremendous amounts of information to us. We share tremendous amounts of information that we don't even know about <laughs> to them. Um, but but there is an interplay of value exchange there, you know. And 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 we've all, everybody in technology, been on a a hunt for removing friction from transactions. Yeah. You know, and that's that's a lot of what um, happens in digital transformation. So it used to be, you know, you go and you make a payment or you deposit money in your, your bank account and your expectation was you could get to it three days from now. Who would put up with that today? Hmm. No one. And, and now you, you, you deposit it, you look at your phone and you want to see it reflected instantaneously, right? And then you want to transfer money, you know, from here to Berlin, from here to Buenos Aires and, and have it show up instantaneously. So, so that's, that's the kind of interaction, the kind of speed that um, we now have to have. And it's not, you know, it's not going back to your Oracle database and your ERP system and waiting for batch jobs to run. Um, that's no longer okay. So speed, speed's so important, right? Right. We're talking about precision decisions, right? One of the things that we talked about uh, yeah. at your event, and and it's we got to make fast decisions, got to make them quickly. There's another concept that's really behind this, right? It's what we call decision velocity. And in decision velocity, machines are able to make decisions a hundred times per second. Humans are able to make a decision per second, and it takes them four weeks to get out of management committee. That is like the worst information asymmetry, decision asymmetry that we get to, right? And so what's going on, right? How do we get to that point where we're confident enough that those automated decisions are, are worth it? So, so you know, a, a, we have a lot of customers doing that today. And, and what they speak about is um, the fidelity of the models. And fidelity of the models depended upon 
how much information they can consume, right? I, I like to make the analogy of, of people, right? You know, when we say, here's a smart person, here's a, a person whose judgment I have confidence in, it's because they have both very specific expertise and very specific information and a lot of it, but they also have a broad contextual uh, set of information and expertise as well. Yep. And to apply both of those simultaneously in milliseconds, right, requires you to be able to access more data into broadly parallelized, you know, computations and Spark or pick your favorite, you know, AI ML framework. Um, and, and I think all of us are trying to figure out how do we do that? We have customers who tell us we're adding 10 to 100 new data sources a month into our modeling. Okay, think about that. And all that streaming in, in some by some definition of real time, it's not I get it refreshed on a monthly basis, right? I get it refreshed multiple times a day, multiple times an hour. And so being in the moment, you know, is sort of my definition of real time. And that's what we're striving to support at Aerospike, right? That scale, that breadth and throughput. But what's really behind it is, is sort of a simple thing. We all, you know, know a smart person, a well-educated person. It's not somebody who knows one thing. It's not somebody who's access only to a part of the information. It's someone who has access to a broad range and can hold that in their head, right? Simultaneously pattern match it against the, the broad contextual reference data they have. And that's the game that's being played out now. And we are trying, you know, as fast as we can evolve because because people are really driving this, you know, precision decisioning as, as Ray calls it, right? Very fast now. It's evolving continuously. And, you know, we're trying to evolve with it. We had a uh, head of McKinsey Research on our show a couple of weeks ago. And uh, uh, one of the key findings uh, of their, uh, you know, in pandemic consumer uh, buying behavior was that 75% of Americans have switched brands during the pandemic. And number, number one, two reason was safety and accessibility. So when we talk about supply chain disruption, try buying a fridge or furniture, or maybe early on toilet paper or hand sanitizer, but uh, it was, the number was remarkable. Certain countries like India was 91% had switched brands. These are unheard of numbers in terms of, uh, you know, a shock to brand loyalty. So it's, it's part of the trust equation because safety, for example, is now a brand pillar. And to gain trust, you have to demonstrate speed to value. And if you demonstrate speed to value uh, you know, consistently, you can hopefully earn trust. So what are your thoughts about what we've experienced in the last seven months in terms of the pandemic's role in accelerating the need for precision decision making, execution velocity, co-creating value at the speed of need, at the moment of truth, during that customer journey where you recognize buying signals and you provide the right product on the right channel to the right person with the right value proposition. Uh, on the e-commerce side, McKinsey said there was 10 years of adoption accelerated just in the past three months. So there's, there's definitely clear signals that transformation, digital transformation, and rapid decision making is now a boardroom discussion because it's a matter of survival. It's no longer nice to have. Your thoughts? Yeah. So, 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 I participate in a couple other um, sort of roundtable things with investors, and 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 one of the things I brought up early in the uh, cycle with them was that supply chains were going to be disrupted pretty quickly because they'd been optimized you know, to be just in time and that there wasn't much slack in the system and that it provide, provided great efficiency, but not great resiliency necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so there, there are two sides to this story, right? One is that things became broken for a while. I mean, we all had the experience of walking into a grocery store, which at least in this country, you know, was a, a new experience for most of us and the shelves were empty. <laughs> And the shelves remained empty for some things for longer than any of us had expected. You know, being, being a guy who worked in supply chain software for an extended period of time, 
I was sitting there looking at what it was, looking at what the dependent, you know, raw materials were, thinking about how much outs outsourcing, offshoring had gone on, what the length of those supply chains were, where the virus was impacting, you know, and, and thinking about how this chess game was going to be played. One of the things that struck me was how fast it all came back. I mean, it seemed slow, but how fast it all came back, given that there were no real buffering anymore. You know, we sold software on the basis of you will not have to have this much inventory. Right. You, know, you will not have to have this in your warehouse. Right. I mean, this, this is like the, and it's the longest supply chains ever too, right? I mean, you're coming yeah. from China, right? The yeah. stuff that's yeah. being made yeah. is like three months old by the time it shows up. It's not like it's yeah. being made like a couple of weeks in advance. Right. I mean, it's like, can you imagine Halloween candy? That's like another one. Right. I mean, who would have known they make the candy six months in advance. Right. That's right. That's, that's another interesting thing. So, so it's so tough. But but here again, you, you know, the ability to respond faster. Right. To, to, to see and, and to have a picture of your supply chain. And, and I think Don was touching on some interesting things where, you know, the pendulum swings back and forth between you know, centralization and decentralization. And, and I mm -hmm. think it's going to swing back toward decentralization. Mm -hmm. That makes the problem somewhat more complex. But the more decentralized it is, the more possibility of mm -hmm. resiliency comes. And then you're starting to have to share information across a network with more points in it yeah. and, and have, you know, transparency not in a linear supply chain where I've decided this is the guy I can leverage the most against and get the lowest price, but that has optionality built into it. And now we have the tools with AI and ML and with the ability to process data in real time. And like I said, we're trying to keep up. We're constantly working on the distribution of data, the sharing of data. You know, we just came out with a complete rewrite of our cross data center replication. Why? because the world is distributed and we think that there will be more decentralization and more sharing of data, not only wow, with so you sure you sure Don Tapscott's view here on this decentralization that's about to happen. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, I, I think it's something that swings back and forth. You, you know, there's probably a golden mean and we don't quite recognize it when we pass it going both ways, <laughs> you know, but, but I think it's going to swing back towards de decentralization. Um, because that's the basis of resiliency. And, and as I said, the models become somewhat more complex. Data has to be shared across more points. You know, blockchain, blockchain in itself mathematically is kind of fascinating. But what's really fascinating are, are the implications in terms of contracts, the speed at which contracts can be put in place and become transparent and enforceable, right? Um, and I think that that's just more data, more real-time data that has to feed into things like the ability to say, I'm supporting, you know, 200 contracts where I had five yeah. before because I want optionality. I would like to have toilet paper come from, you know, Finland as well as Vancouver. Yeah. Why? Well, you know, if you distribute the risk, we all know this technically, like, does anybody have one data center? That's a cloud vendor. Does anybody have one zone? No. Would it be more efficient to have it all together, one thing? Yeah. Sure. But we distribute the possibility of failure. We know that technically, and I think that's going to ripple through supply chains. I think it's going to ripple through organizational models. Um, it, you know, the people who had distributed workforces yeah. were better off. Hey, these guys got sick, but we shifted the work. Oh, wait, these guys are well now, <laughs> you, you know. Yeah. So, hey, I'm, I'm going to give you four use cases and you tell me what's going to change. Right. So let's I'll, I'll give them ahead of time. Fraud prevention, customer experience, payment processing and recommendation engines. So what changes with fraud prevention? You know, fr fr fraud detections changing sort of radically because it used to be we were trying to find and identify the bad guy. Right. And now we're trying to understand the customer more deeply and be able to, to, to recognize that behavior and that person and to know more than just one track of behavior about them, right? And so that's meant capturing more data, 
over a longer period of time and keeping that and having a more sophisticated model of who Ray is. I mean, you know, Ray, how often are you in the same place? <laughs> I'm not. That's the thing. But now I'm no. home for a year now. If I go out traveling to like 40 different cities in like five weeks, you know, it's going to be fraud every transaction. Yeah, so <laughs> I'm a little worried. <laughs> you know, this like, is the contextual information that has to be there. And so I think the models have become much richer. I mean, you know, we have new expectations about it. We, we like it when it says, you know, you bought these three things and you're, you know, in Moscow. You know, this happened to me once on a credit card. And then they, and you go like, is this you? And you go, yes, you know, done. Isn't that great? As opposed to, gee, you know, you travel a lot, so I'm going to treat you this way. If it was somebody else who never leaves the U.S., they treat it differently. They think that's fraud. They wouldn't just, can you, can you confirm this in a nice way, right? So I think that's fraud. Just richer models with more data held over longer period of times to create a truer picture of yeah, I know I had that happen to me. I was in Dubai, London, and New York all in like one day, and someone thought it was massive fraud. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. For, for, yeah, for a $3 bottle of water. I mean, come on. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, a big takeaway talking to you, Lenny, is uh, this notion of uh, balance between efficiency versus resiliency. Uh, yes. Not even, you know, not verse, but really just a balance between the two. And, and when I when you're talking about resiliency, you know, in so many words, it's 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 a decentralized framework. It's diversity of suppliers. It's modularity of design for easy substitution. It's uh, sharing insights uh, at optimal speed. Sharing insights across the ecosystem. So yes, there's complexity and additional nodes and systems. But this is why you need a fast database. This is why you need to lean into right. technology because. I think one of the biggest blind sites, blind spots in business pre-pandemic was not valuing decentralized models as much as we should because we light switch in March, the world went purely digital, purely decentralized. You know, you couldn't go in the office, you couldn't go to your store, you couldn't watch your favorite team compete in person. So uh, it's 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 remarkable. So can can you talk about again emphasis on? speed to value what advice you know you're, you're the chief you're the lead strategy guy at your company when you're sitting in front of a ceo and the ceo says lenly help me maintain relevance for my brand and my company what's what's the advice you give them yeah i i think the biggest thing is to to know your customer right and, yeah. and, and the expectation of understanding you know several things the context in which they're operating, you know, to be aware of the world, right? The, the, the whole reference model that that customer is operating in, to know specifically what you can do for them mm -hmm. and, and to try and try and engage with them to map your value into their goals, right? Um, and I think that what, what's happening right now is that, as we talked about, the, the move to become digital has been accelerated. Yeah. But I think that the, the understanding of what the implications of going digital are is sort of unevenly distributed. You know, the people who started and have been prosecuting this for as much as 10 years for some people, you know, five years for other, it is that if you're getting into it now seriously and you've been dabbling in it, what happens is you've opened up your systems, just open them up to instead of 1,000, 2,000, 5,000 users, you're talking about 20 million, 30 million people coming at you and you know wanting access to the status of their orders, to mm -hmm. understanding you know, where their order is, and you're opening up your internal systems to all of them. Makes and sense. that means data shift. volumes, that means yeah. massive read volumes. I mean, we all come, I always like to say your customers come armed. They yeah. come armed. Yeah. You know, they, sometimes, they're too, sometimes they're two fisted too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and they're going, going continually saying, what, what happened to my order? It, you know, not because it's late, but just yeah. where, where is it? And they can do that. And they expect wow. truth in that. Yeah. So there's hey, a Linda, cost. Thank you so there's, much. There's a, for, there's a cost to radical transparency. But if you execute well, the, the, the value is you earn their trust and hopefully brand loyalty. 
Yeah, it, 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 is, it is a trust relationship thing. Hey, Ray, great. No, no, we're here with Lensley Hensling, Chief Strategy Officer at Aerospike. You can follow him at Twitter at Park City Gliss, G L I S S E. I'm going to have to ask you why you chose that Twitter handle another time. So, yeah. thanks so much for being on the show. Thanks for being right. here and uh, sharing your Friday with us. Thanks, so, thank you very much. This is Brilliant. awesome. We Brilliant. are here.